Well, native title, as we've seen in the case of the Murray Islands, they had a title to their land, the right to the possession, enjoyment and occupation, because they were the prior occupiers. They were in possession when the Europeans came and claimed sovereignty. And the claim of sovereignty didn't extinguish their property rights. And they have continued because they've never been extinguished. There has been no other owner. So therefore, it is the Murray Islanders who own the land. And what is perhaps uh, critical once again for the discussion is the High Court didn't give land away. It didn't grant land to the Aborigines. It didn't reward them. It didn't compensate them because Australia High Court judges had a rush of guilt to the head. They didn't give land. They simply recognised that it had always been in the possession of those who still lived there of those groups who were still living on or near their land, who continued to have a traditional association, who still had the cultural links, who still knew the principles of management and ownership of the land, these people had never been dispossessed. Their land had never been, their title had never been extinguished. So they remain the owners under native title, customary native title. Uh, according to their own laws, according to their own laws. And that is why it is critical that people do have a knowledge and understanding of their own legal traditions, because they are the traditions which now become part of the common law. Questions of who owns what on Murray Island have to be decided according to Murray Island land-owning traditions. Now, as we all know, by applying this principle, only a limited number of people will be able to establish successful claims of native title. It's uncertain at this stage, because we don't know how the system will work, how many will be able to do this. It is very likely, however, that a significant area of Western Australia that is now called vacant crown land will eventually become the possession and the ownership of the local people under native title. It is also very likely, of course, that rights over the sea, certainly the sea a short distance from shore, estuaries and things like this, will also be seen as being uh, having native title, which won't exclude other uses, but it will mean that Aboriginal people will be seen as having a real legal interest in land and the shores and the immediate offshore areas. They will have a legal interest which will have to be considered. Well, let me, uh, let me uh, move on to the question of compensation. The question of compensation. And here, of course, we touch on those areas of social justice and land acquisition which are also seen by many people, more than we would wish, to be an exercise in guilt, a giving of things to people who don't deserve them, uh, a giving uh, to people who don't really legitimately, do, have no legitimate claim that this is part, as they say, of the guilt industry, this is part of the Aboriginal industry. But what's the truth? One of the critical things the High Court is, has done is that it has cleared up for all time, unless the judgment is overthrown in the future, which I think is unlikely. The court has cleared up for all time, in a legal sense, in a European, a British legal sense, what actually happened with Aboriginal property, Aboriginal land. Up until the judgment, we were very vague about it. We couldn't really say what happened. But we felt it had all happened a long time ago and there wasn't much you could do about it. Either it was a question of the Aborigines not establishing property rights because they were nomadic in the way that the Western Australian government is still arguing. Either they have never in all those centuries and thousands of occupation, they have never established real property rights. So there was nothing there when the British arrived. No property rights at all. That was one 
one possible story. The other possible story was that yes, there was some sort of interest in land, but it was all wiped out when the claim of sovereignty was made. Now you see, both of those arguments have been struck down. And that is why it is so important to our, our understanding of our own history and our own legal history. They've struck down the belief that a claim of sovereignty took property away. It doesn't. And they have struck down the idea that people who had a nomadic hunter-gatherer economy couldn't own land. So they have destroyed the old story that was so comforting. Yes, well, it happened a long time ago and there's nothing you can do about it we're not even sure how. And it's probably the Aborigines' fault because they were so backward and they didn't use the land properly. That was the comforting story we hugged for 200 years. What's the story now after Mabo? It's a very different one. We know that the Aborigines all over Australia were in possession of their land. They didn't have a title from the Crown, quite obviously, but they were in possession. They had a form of property. And the common law, which was brought into Australia in 1788, the common law, British law, could recognise that form of title as it had done in North America. That indeed was the imperial tradition in Australia. The common law could recognise native title. So the story begins with the Crown having the sovereignty but not the property property being in the hands of the Aborigines. The Crown, because it has the sovereign power, can extinguish property rights. It can today. It always caught anyone's property rights ultimately can be extinguished by the sovereign power. And the native title perhaps is more vulnerable. But nevertheless, uh, anyone's property can ultimately can be uh, taken by the sovereign, by the sovereign power. So what we know now is that the land did not disappear, the property of Aboriginal did not disappear in just one blinding flash. It happened bit by bit over 200 years. And some of it disappeared quite recently. And of course, in some parts of Australia, it has not disappeared to this day, or not until Premier Court gets his legislation uh, uh, with the royal assent, and then for a short time it will disappear. Until that law is struck down, native title will have ceased to exist. Now we also know, particularly in the Judgment Deed and Courtroom, as they point out, that a lot of that property was taken wrongfully, as they say, five times, in effect illegally, illegally, and it was taken with violence, and there was no compensation, although compensation has been a fundamental part of English property law for many hundreds of years. In fact, some of the great struggles in British history against the absolute monarchs, against the Stuarts, was that very principle of could the Crown take property without compensation. The whole of British constitutional and legal history, it's one of the great flowers of British liberty that no person can have their property taken by the Crown without compensation. It's the stuff which the Conservatives love applies to their property. <laughs> now, that raises the question you know, of compensation. Now, we know that after the Race Discrimination Act of 1975, compensation will indeed have to be paid if where average interests have been diminished. But before 1975, it's a different <coughs> story. Can you compensate retrospectively? Well, this, of course, is a difficult question and one that Australia has scarcely begun to face up to. In the United States, Canada and New Zealand, of course, this has been done. This has been done. There was a United States Claims Commission which sat for 32 years to listen to Indian claims for compensation. Canada has had for a long time similar mechanisms and of course the Waitangi Tribunal uh, for the last few years has been given the onerous task of looking at all property dealings going back to 1840. However, it's very much easier there than in Australia because in most cases, property changed hands either by treaty or purchase 
where there was a particular legal transfer at a specific time and there is documentation. So if you need to, you can go back to the treaty between the United States government and the Seminole in 1824 and you can find exactly what the terms of the treaty were, who signed it, uh, and the exact day on which it was done and how much land was, in, was, was involved. So you, it's much easier then in that situation to go back and say, well, yes, the Seminole were really were given a lot less than they should. The, the price of land at that time should have been five cents an acre, and they only got one cent an acre. So therefore, they were diddled, and therefore, we will pay compensation. Now, it's, as I say, it's much more difficult to do that in Australia, much more difficult, because it will be very difficult to get that sort of detail that you probably need for specific cases of compensation unless they are fairly recent, perhaps. Now, this then raises the question of the need for some general compensation, hence the idea of a social justice package and land acquisition. And in, in accepting that, it seems to me that Aboriginal Australia, to the extent that they agree with have accepted a very great deal. There is a complete lack of appreciation in most of white Australia just how much has been conceded. That is, Aboriginal negotiators have accepted by accepting validation. It is a great gesture to white Australia. That is, to draw the line under the lecture of 1975 and say, we accept that what has been done has been done. The land now has new owners who can't be dispossessed fairly, and therefore we have to accept this legal fact. We acquiesce. And we also, of course, as a demand, accept the sovereignty. Now, they are very, very significant concessions, which I don't think the wider community has any appreciation of just how large concessions they are and how people should be, as I say, uh, grateful and not be grudging when compensation packages are worked out. They should not be grudging, nor should they be grudging even in a practical sense. Otherwise, they, the alternative is simply to have the thing fought out case by case through every court in the land. And that is not really what anyone wants. Well, let me come on to, uh, uh, let me just finish then with native title. Now, the High Court, in accepting, bringing native title into the common law of Australia, was not setting out on a great legal adventure. It was not on a guilt trip. It was not a court that was out of control. It indeed was bringing Australian law into line with, with the central tradition of the common law, of the English common law in the empire. It was Australia that was out of step. It was Australia which could not really uh, legally explain how the indigenous people had been dispossessed. It was Australia which had a fundamental problem at the very, very foundation of its legal system. And it is the high court which I think courageously decided the time had come to, to untangle this mess, to resolve this issue, to try and bring Australian legal practice into line with common law countries. And I suspect that the judgment has been read and appreciated and understood in the common law jurisdictions in the English-speaking world as a very, very fine judgment within the tradition. So I think uh, ultimately, if we move on then to, if I can move on to the last point of politics, my assessment is that the federal legislation will pass. Certainly, uh, it will pass eventually, and I suspect it may well pass before the end of 